First, I wanted to give you just a little bit of a background on what it is that we do at SomaLogic. Um, our goal is primarily in developing tests that we want to be able to use um, for uh, precision medicine to really help people understand and, and take control of their own health. And the way we do that is by starting with um, lots of different samples that we're typically acquiring from either collaborators or world-leading biobanks that have thousands of participants and then making thousands of individual protein measurements on each of those samples. Right now we measure about 5,000 proteins and then we're able to integrate those protein measurements with various uh, clinical data on the health states of those individuals. Using those measurements, we can then apply various um, algorithms and models using artificial intelligence and machine learning to develop precise tests that are associated with those various clinical states from the samples that we have acquired. So how do we do this and what, what's unique about the SomaLogic platform? We're basically taking a, a protein measurement challenge, which is very difficult, and turning it into a DNA measurement solution. And the way we do that is by starting with a proprietary reagent that we have developed here at SomaLogic that we call SomaMERS, slow off rate modified aptamers. These are reagents that are single stranded DNA, but they have incorporated in them uh, modifications that make them look kind of like pieces of DNA with amino acid side chains hanging off of them. And those modified nucleotides, they're not exactly amino acid side chains, but they're very similar to them. And those modifications enable very specific high affinity interactions with protein um, specific shapes. And then we take those reagents and we use them combined together in, in thousands um, to measure their specific protein targets out of biological samples. We go through a series of steps where we're essentially removing any of the free protein that's not bound to a somomer reagent. We follow that up by removing all of the free somomer that are not bound to a protein. So we end up with these complexes where the somomer concentration is proportional to the protein target that we had in our initial sample. And as many of you are aware, measuring the amount or counting the amount of DNA in a sample is a lot easier than counting the amount of protein in a sample, given how, how, um, the, how different each protein can be. So we simply have to hybridize these somomers to a complementary strand on a microarray and measure a fluorescent signal from that complementary strand to determine the concentration of the somomer that we recovered from the sample, which then gives us a metric for the protein that was in our, uh, our initial binding step. So we are using this, of course, to, uh, as I mentioned, to develop proteomics-based precision health. We think that this approach enables us to take advantage of all of the things that are needed to really be able to have a, a, a real-time precision health proteomics um, assay. Uh, antibodies and mass spec, you're oftentimes choosing between whether um, you have a large number of analytes that you're measuring or you're able to measure analytes that are either very low concentration or span a very wide dynamic range. With the Soma Scan assay, we're able to achieve both of those, um, those, those requirements because we're measuring 5,000 proteins in each sample. And it's the same 5,000 proteins in each sample as opposed to being a, a different set of 5,000 sample to sample. And we're able to do that over the concentration range of proteins that are typically observed in plasma or serum. Uh, we are able to do this fairly rapidly at a cost that is competitive. We're able to scale both the number of analytes that we measure by developing additional reagents, as well as able to scale the number of samples that we can run um, just by adding additional instrumentation. The reproducibility is, is quite um, outstanding with a median CV across the platform of 5,000 measurements at right around 5%. And the amount of sample we need is on the order of about 55 microliters 
um, per run in order to measure all 5,000, uh, make all 5,000 of these measurements in one individual assay. So that's just a very, very brief um, snippet of, of how the SOMASCAN assay works. And um, we would be happy to explain more to people who have individual questions, but now I'd like to turn it over to Benoit, who is going to talk to you a lot more about how exactly his group has been using our platform. So thanks, uh, Sherry, for the introduction about the, the, the platform. Um, and I would like to thank the organizer of this webinar for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to present our work here. Uh, this is a work that we published a few months ago uh, in Nature Medicine. And I will go over the results. So it's going to be about the undulating changes of the human plasma proteome during aging and how these changes are actually linked to disease. So we all know that the main role of the blood is to deliver oxygen to uh, the whole body. Uh, but tissues and organs secrete protein in the blood. And we can use this, tissue, this uh, plasma proteome as an indicator of the physiological state of a person. Uh, as you know, multiple factors influence the plasma proteome. Some of them are hard-coded, such as the genome, but others, like the diet or the lifestyle, really depend on each person. However, it seems that the main source of variance in the plasma proteome is actually aging. So the big question is, uh, what in the blood is a changing during aging? And this is a very exciting question and very important question because recent studies from our group and others showed that the plasma proteome play a key in active role in aging. So for example, young blood from uh, reverses different aspects of aging in, uh, in multiple tissues, such as the brain or the muscles. And if we take the example of the brain, Almost a dozen of proteins, uh, of plasma proteins, have been identified as impacting brain function. Uh, as you can see here, some of them are pro aging, some of them are anti aging. But what's really remarkable is that these proteins were identified out of just a few hundred that were screened. But the plasma proteome is way, is way more complex. Um, we were fortunate to, to, to use the version of the SOMASCAN assay. Uh, able to measure almost 3,000 proteins. Uh, and we obtained measurement from more than 4,000 subjects. So from 20 years old to 95 years old. And these 4,000 4, subjects are actually coming from two different cohorts. Uh, one is the interval cohort uh, in UK and the proteomic part, proteomic and genomic part was led by Adam Butterworth. And the second cohort is the long genetic cohort. And this is a great collaboration that we have uh, with Sofia Nilman and Nir Barcelai from Einstein College. Actually, Nir is going to talk right after me about these exciting findings uh, uh, when focusing on this longevity cohort. Um, so the first thing we tried to do when we got the data is, was to, to try to answer this very simple question. So can we determine people's age using the plasma proteome? like we can do with the epigenome. So what we did, we used two thirds of the samples to create an aging clock. And we tested this clock um, on the rem remaining samples. And we tried to determine whether deviations from the, this clock can provide functional information. And with this deviation are linked with clinical and functional readouts. So the clock we uh, identified was, we built was, was based on 373 protein but uh, we obtained very similar results uh, using only nine proteins. And as you can see on this graph, the correlation between uh, chronological age and predicted age is very good. Uh, the median error is only 2.6 here, and the person correlation coefficient is 0.97. And this is for the validation data set, not the samples that were used to, to build this clock. But you can see that some subject like this one is actually are de deviating from, uh, from this clock. Uh, this guy is around 25, but he looks on around 60 based on his uh, plasma proteome. Uh, uh, and this, this is actually not the only subject that is deviating from this clock. So what we did, we calculated delta H for each of the different subjects. And delta H actually represents the deviation from this clock. And we tried to correlate delta H with clinical functional readout. 
So it's what you see here. Each dot in this graph represents the association between delta H and a functional or clinical trait. And we can see a pretty good reproducibility between the discovery data set here on the x-axis and the validation data set on the y-axis. So when we look at the traits most associated with delta H, we found that uh, physical grip is negatively correlated with uh, delta H. That means that people that are looking older based on their plasma photo, uh, they have lower physical grip. And on the other hand, we, uh, we found a positive correlation between delta H with the time needed to perform some uh, cognitive test. So this really suggests that there is some functional information in the plasma proteome. And we can capture this functional information using this aging proteome clock. So I just want to mention that this analysis has been done using a simple linear model. And as you can see here, this is the, the different trajectories of this protein during aging. Most of these trajectories are nonlinear. So we are currently trying different models to optimize this clock. And it seems that nonlinear approaches can slightly uh, improve age prediction. So a question that uh, we have uh, a lot is actually if this aging signature is conserved between species. And this is partially true. So in the paper, we describe a 46 protein signature that is conserved between mouse and human. So here you have the list of the different protein. And having this 46 protein signature actually uh, allowed us to test some uh, anti-aging intervention. So here, this is the example of uh, the effect of heterochronic parabiosis. Uh, as you can see on this PCA, the heterochronic parabiosis mice are in between the isochronic ones. So that suggests that this conserved signature can capture the effect of uh, aging interventions. Uh, actually, this is not only the, the proteins from these clocks that are uh, nonlinear, that, that change in a nonlinear manner, but it seems that most of the plasma proteome uh, have this nonlinear behavior. So we wanted, we needed to quantify these changes. And this is actually not a trivial question. Uh, but I, th I think we found a pretty easy solution. So what we did, we, we developed a sliding, a differential expression sliding window approach. So in red, you have uh, subjects that are below a certain age for a given protein. So this is only one protein here. Uh, so here, this is the subjects that are below uh, 20, uh, 30 years old. And in blue, you have subjects that are above 30. Um, the lines represent the average value in each bucket. And you can see that the red line is significantly lower than the blue line. And we can slide this window and quantify how this protein is changing during aging. So for example, for this protein, you can see uh, strong differences in young, and then you reach a plateau. So you see differences between the blue and, and red line in young, and then you have no differences anymore. So we apply, we apply this approach to other protein, and this one shows a linear increase until 60 and an acceleration in the very old. And that one doesn't change at all during aging. So for each of the 3,000 protein, we can estimate when they change during aging and how much they change. So this is what is shown on this heat map. Um, in blue, you have proteins that are downregulated around a specific, specific age. For example, here you have proteins that are downregulated around 35 years old. And in yellow, you have proteins that are regulated around a specific age. So here are proteins that are regulated only in old. But you have proteins that are regulated during the entire lifespan. So another way to look at the data is actually to count how many protein are changing during aging and how many protein are changing at each specific age. And we are surprised to, to find three ma main waves of aging proteins. Uh, one in young, around 34, one in middle age, around 60, and one in old, around 80. So this is the waves that you can see here. So the young one here, the middle one, the middle age here, and the older here. And as you can see on, the, on this Venn diagram, actually the overlap between the three different waves of aging protein is only partial. So we try to understand uh, what are these different waves of aging protein. So to do this, uh, we rank the protein significantly changing at each of these waves. 
based on their, their p-value. So it's what we uh, see here for the young wave. So we did the same for middle age and for old age. And uh, we try to understand the link between this ranked um, list of protein and genetic determinants, a biological pathway, and the protein defining function and disease. So let's start with the genome. Um, so this network shows you actually the links between the proteome and the genome. So each blue dot is a gene and each uh, yellow dot is a protein. And you see a, lo a lot of association between pairs of genes and proteins. So those are uh, cis association. But you can see some hubs. So genes that are affecting a lot of proteins. Not only the proteins they are coding for. So it's what is called transassociation. And what we observe is, uh, is that there is a decrease or that the importance of the, of the trans association actually decreased during aging. So if, if there is a decrease of the importance of the genome in the uh, plasma protein variants, it means that other factors are actually affecting the plasma protein. So if it's not the genome, what could it be? So we looked at different biological pathways and we mined three different databases, the most three of the most comprehensive database um, for pathway analysis, gene ontology, uh, KEG, and the reactor database. So in Young, we observed a downregulation of a lot of different pathways and uh, mainly structural pathways such as uh, the extracellular matrix. Um, in middle age, we see an increase of a lot of protein involved in binding functions but we also see a decrease um, in blood microparticular. And this decrease stays significant in all. But we see other pathways that are enriched. So for example, we have an enrichment for protein involved in PMP signaling. So these proteins are um, a group of proteins from the TGF beta superfamily, and they are involved in a lot of functions, including uh, inflammation. So this is really different pathways that are um, and which in these different ways of aging protein. And here I'm just showing the top pathway, but many more are changing in the three different ways. So finally, we looked at the link between this ranked list of aging protein and as uh, a protein defining um, physical uh, function and uh, diseases. So here, this is the example of hand grip. So we identified plasma protein changing with hand grip, and we asked uh, whether the hand grip proteins overlap with the waves of aging proteins. And we found an overlap between the aging proteins defining middle age and old, here in blue and uh, uh, red, and the protein associated with changes of hand grip. It's when uh, actually hand grip changes the most. Uh, finally, we looked at different diseases. Uh, here, this is body mass index, which is known to change uh, during the entire lifespan. And we, we observed actually uh, an overlap between the proteins defining body mass, body, body mass index and the three different waves of aging proteins. So there was no specific enrichment. But this is a different story when we look at uh, age-related disease such as cardiovascular disease here. So the protein characterizing cardiovascular disease uh, overlapped a little bit with the protein defining young age, but overlap uh, way more with the protein defining middle age and old age. And this is when the risk of cardiovascular disease strongly increases. So finally, we looked at uh, Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, and we observed an enrichment for protein defining middle age and old age. Uh, that's really interesting because um, this aging cohort we had is cognitively normal. And we found this uh, overlap between the protein defining Alzheimer disease versus age match control and the aging proteome changing in, your, in old. And it's actually even more impressive for Down syndrome because the subject in this study, in the Down syndrome study, were below 20 years old. And we see a strong overlap with the protein changing in old. So for these two diseases, uh, our results really support the concept of accelerated aging, at least at the proteomic level. Uh, I'm going to stop here, uh, but I, I would like to mention that we uh, built a shiny hub to, to mine the aging, aging plasma protein. So if you have a favorite genes or protein and you want to know how this protein is changing during aging, uh, this is the place to go. And in this app, we have 3,000 protein. 
So this is, uh, uh, yeah, just to summarize before the acknowledgement slide, uh, what we, we, we found in this, and what we described in this nature method, uh, medicine paper. So we discovered a blood-based proteomic clock that can tell us how well we age. And we uh, found that part of the aging proteome is conserved between species. And this can be used for uh, deeper investigation and to test uh, anti-aging interventions. Uh, we also found that the aging plasma proteome, that aging in the plasma proteome is not something linear. And we've observed waves of aging protein and we see uh, three different peaks of changes at 34, 60, and 78 years old. And we really think that understanding it more and integrating these undulations of the plasma proton during aging uh, can, can lead to more targeted uh, therapeutics. Um, and yeah, this is the most important slide. So um, I would like to thank all the, the people that were, that were part uh, of this project, especially Tony Weisskore, who is uh, from Stanford, who is the, uh, lead author, the senior author of this paper, and uh, Nir Barcelai and Sophia Milman from the Einstein College. And uh, I'm gonna um, stop here and I'm gonna uh, let Nir uh, share with you his exciting findings uh, on the longevity cohort. Uh, thank you, Benoit. That was a, a terrific work and, and we'll do this uh, more. And I'm going to pick on the point that you showed uh, Benoit showed three uh, peaks of aging. Uh, I'm going to take uh, the time of where, where between 60, what happens after 65, which is like the formal uh, age. And, and to pick really on this title of how to die young at a very old age. And the reason I'm doing that is because I was interested in why centenarians are aging so slowly? Why do they live long and get their disease longer? And the poster child of our study is this family there, the Khan family. I have an IRB approval to say their name, their approval to say their name. And here's, here's a picture of those four siblings that were born between 1910 and 1920 and the same uh, position 90 years later because what's unique with those guys all kids of two parents is that they live to be over the age of 102. Uh, Helen, who's standing there on the left, she died at 110, 107, um, uh, 109 years old. Um, when I met Helen at age 100, she was uh, smoking and I asked her, uh, did any of your physician tell you to stop smoking? And she said, all four physicians that told me to stop smoking, they died. And, and of course, the point here is that our centenarians have been resilient to their effects of the environment. And what we find is that they have those longevity genes that slows their aging prospect. And we have 3,000 uh, people in our cohort. There's other thing that's special about them. Some of it I'll mention later. About 750 of them are centenarians, and then the rest belong to two groups, uh, people without longevity in their family and people who are children of centenarians themselves. Um, so uh, one of the most important thing in our, uh, in, our uh, in aging now is and, and Benoit uh, alluded to that, is to understand the difference between biological and chronological age. It's really important at every age, you know, if at age 50 we would know if we are really 40 years old or 60 years old, well, if we're 40 years old, we don't have to do colonoscopy then maybe. There, there's a lot of interest to do that. And so uh, the first thing we asked applying those um, uh, somomeres, 5,000 proteins applied on 1,000 subjects, is to ask what happens between age 65 and 95. And what happened is right here, and I'm not assuming everything, so if you don't know what's Volcano, uh, volcano plot, I'll, I'll tell you that. What you see here is something that looks like a volcano that shots hot red stones up uh, to the air. And, and really what the volcano plots represent is 
the more red, the, the red stones, the more they are going high and also far um, uh, are, are really significant. Now, the significant changes between 65 and 95 are represented at the y x, and you see the p value here is 10 to the minus 80 up to the 10 to the minus 80. So, if we're really great significant, now they can go far as far here to the right as this N-terminal probe BNP goes, that suggests that it has a huge effect, not only a significant effect, and some of those proteins are going down. Now, when we see this scan on uh, these results on 10,000 uh, on, on 1, people, uh, we really wanna understand a little bit what are those proteins, I mean, are those proteins the ones that are causing aging? Um, or maybe um, when we start the breakdown of aging, there is a, a response, for example, inflammatory response. So we see things that are protective against aging. How much are those uh, breakdowns that we can uh, target? So uh, just seeing those proteins without doing anything is interesting for each protein, but not as informative. Um, I want to make a point in this slide that those are the top proteins that are coming up. Uh, those that are in red have been shown in a previous uh, work uh, that was done by Soma uh, together with Luigi uh, Ferrugi that had a scan then of about 1400 proteins. And we added in the black, and you don't see the whole picture, but we got threefold more proteins than he did. So the fact that we have 5,000 protein really didn't seem to exhaust the changes that occur uh, with aging. So we're looking forward uh, scans with more proteins. And the proteins that are with green here are proteins that actually we kind of knew and had data that they are associated with aging. So we validated some of what we thought was a biomarker of aging. But really it's important to know what are those proteins. And as Benoit, Benoit showed, and I'm going to show it differently, there are very different ways to look at, at those proteomics and to look at their pathway. And I'm just showing you the one that I thought was informative for me and what you see here first is that the pathway that came up first and mo most significant has to do with the insulin IGF um, uh, proteins. And uh, most of our longevity genes, I think we have more people with, pro with uh, functional mutations in their growth hormone IGF signaling pathway than any other um, longevity genes in our centenarians. So it's just interesting that it came up as first. But what was really more interesting is those that are here in red, that I was kind of disappointed at first, but now I, I totally get it because what they reflect is the breakdown, really the breakdown of aging, such as degradation of extracellular met metrics, such as degranulation of platelets, collagen degradation, uh, neutrophil degranulation. So there's a lot of here that we're capturing as breakdown. And I think it's important to keep in mind because no matter how we target aging, and there are increasing ways to do that, uh, maybe one of the common thing that we have to do is actually stop this breakdown of aging. So, uh, the first thing is I said, well, we have biomarkers of aging, but it's really, we have a higher order for those proteins. We want to show that when we use gerotherapeutics or geroprotector or, or um, drugs that target aging, that we can follow the effect. I mean, we can do phase three uh, trial on all of them and spends billions of dollars to get a lot of companies that wouldn't make it, but we really need to have something that in a short-term treatment will show that it actually uh, goes down with aging so, uh, or change with aging or, or 
or change the proteomic to, to be younger so that we can get confidence with the drug that we're using um, uh, in humans. We uh, do agree, us geroscientists agree that there are eight hallmarks for aging. There might be more, they might be changing, um, but all those hallmarks of aging are actually used to target aging. And the nice thing is that they are uh, co correlated to each other. So, um, so for example, if you give rapamycin to uh, do something with the metabolic uh, uh, dysregulation, um, you get effects on immune response and inflammation and uh, mitochondria and proteostasis. So, um, so uh, this is how we can go. And some of the drugs that are in use now are here. Um, we have some uh, uh, people who we have the transcripts and not the proteomic now, but that, that's how we have to think about what we do next with those proteins. Now, I don't have a result of of what happens with thera therapeutics, but I didn't tell you up front, but those thousand people, 500 of them are offspring of parents of usual survival. They didn't have longevity in their family. They're what we can call the control. And they depict pretty much the same proteome that I showed you before, but because it's only 500, the p-value here goes up to 50, but it's kind of the same, uh, the same picture. And now I'm adding here 500 people who are offspring of parents of exceptional longevity. They are offspring of centenarians. And they have uh, less diseases uh, when you adjust for age. They are really overall healthier. And as you can see, their volcano plots is much more pink. They don't have as many significant proteins coming up as the offspring of centenarians. In fact, they have more than 300 less of those proteins, suggesting that there's a real correlation between biological and chronological age. And not only that, when uh, we see what are their proteome compared to other, their significant proteome compared to other, you see here that they share, all of them are sharing 206 protein, but the offspring of centenarians Maybe when they age later, they will get to all those proteins. But they also have some proteins that uh, are not part, not significant in the age match control that are not offspring of centenarians. And some of those, such as cloto, is certainly a protective protein. So our cohorts, and remember, this is without centenarians. It's only offspring of centenarians versus control. Are, are also an opportunity for us to define some uh, protective proteins. And we're looking at all those others to understand better who they are and how they can be used. Another point I wanna say, which is really, really important. What I'm showing you here is uh, the results in men and, and, and female, and you wouldn't see it here, but you would see it here. Uh, those are females and those are men and they're overlap. And you see that male have 600 proteins and female have only 277 of those proteins. Some of the proteins of the females are related to um, sex hormones. Uh, but uh, what we are kind of saying is that they have a much more stable proteome. So when we are going to actually um, have this uh, set of biomarkers, we either have to have for females or males alone or to look only at those that are overlapping here. Um, we also uh, are doing the clocks the way uh, Bonoit predicts. Um, but what is uh, important for us here, it's not a clock of um, it, it's the clock that we are trying to do is to take the people who died in our study and to really see how the proteomes predicted their mortality. And just like as Benoit had this unusual patient, we had here a patient who's actually 90 years old, but according to the um, 
Somaskan, he is uh, 110 years old, and he actually died several uh, months later. So we have kind of an estimate, not with all the proteins, but with some of the proteins, a, a clock that et estimates a mortality. In fact, this clock estimates mortality, this is the clock with biological age, better than the chronological age or uh, even frailty. So this is kind of the uh, analysis we're doing um, with those uh, proteins. So realizing the promise of proteomics, I would conclude that proteins are biomarkers uh, of biological age. I would also say another thing, we have really good uh, methylation clocks. And I think that the proteomic clocks are more likely to change with therapy than methylation. Some of the methylation is not really changing, uh, although we have some, uh, some uh, examples, but not a lot of examples. So I think proteins are going to be better prediction, uh, uh, better use. Um, uh, they are not only candidates for biomarkers, but of, of successful gerotherapeutics. Um, I didn't have uh, the time to discuss senescent and frailty, but I would say that the proteins, the SASP that are coming out of senescent cell, we depict a lot of them and, and, and we can show what happened in the plasma there. And uh, the same with people in our study who have frailty. And I think the interesting thing with frailty is that half of the proteins are consistent with aging, but frailty has its own proteome. So fasten your seatbelt because I think diagnosis of frailty is going to be a biological and it will be really, really interesting. Uh, we would love, I'm calling Sherry now, <laughs> we would love to have more proteomes. First of all, I didn't include the centenarians. The centenarians can be another way where we, we can discover uh, protective proteins. We also, our study is longitudinal study. So we have the offspring of centenarians and their control longitudinally, and we can see, look at rates of changes rather than cross-sectional as Benoit and I did uh, to look at it uh, longitudinally. And also we have uh, samples of plasma before and after therapy. And I hope I convince you that this is really a, 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 an important thing that's happening. This biomarker is very, very necessary as we develop therapy. And um, I'm grateful to everyone at uh, Somalogic and uh, Benoit and his team for the collaboration and my collaborating, Sophia Milman, Sanish, Joe uh, Vergays. So thank you very much. And I'm uh, bringing this back to Jared. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Nir and Benoit and, and Sherry as well. Um, we'll now address some, some questions uh, that have come up. Uh, let's see. So I think this might be for Sherry, but have you done correlation studies between the somaware technology and standard immunoassays for all proteins? And if so, how tight is that correlation? Right, so there have been several questions in the thread that have to do with correlations with other technologies as well as validation. So I'm gonna kind of wrap several of them up together um, pretty much into to, uh, one answer. Um, so, so basically what we have done as far as um, characterization of our reagents are concerned is that we tip for, for about um, 2000 or so of the reagents, we have um, evaluated if there are any closely related human proteins because we recognize that our reagents are, recognized, are, are, are binding to a specific shape that is on a, um, a protein target of interest. And in some cases that shape might be shared across family members um, or extremely highly uh, related proteins that have different names. And so what we've done is we have evaluated whether or not our reagents can bind to anything that we could commercially purchase that had 40% amino acid identity or higher. And those results are published in a nature paper that, um, that came out in 2018. And we would be happy to, to send people that reference if they're interested in it. So that's one level of characterization that we do. But that leads me to, to kind of our, our thoughts on correlation with other technologies like amino assays. We are recognizing a specific shape on a protein target. And that shape 
may or may not be the same shape that a given antibody is recognizing on that same target. So a lot of antibodies are directed against linear epitopes and um, our somomers are not going to bind to a linear epitope. So we don't expect them to correlate well if a measurement is looking at a denatured epitope. So what we found when we have done direct measurements of correlations with immunoassays is that we, we correlate very, very well, and I realize that's not a quantitative um, term there, but, but with a very high R-squared value if you're looking at a, at a, at a fit. We, we, we are going to correlate very, very well about a third of the time. We're going to correlate okay about a third of the time, and we're not going to correlate that great about a third of the time. And that's comparable to what you see if you take any set of amino acids and compare them to somebody else's amino acids to the same target. So we think that's largely driven by the fact that we're not always recognizing the same shape. So even though we call something the same name based on the physiological target, we may or may not be, be measuring and recognizing the exact same um, thing given how complex a biological sample is with post-translational modifications, complex formation. There are a lot of things that can impact the availability of an epitope that we recognize. Now with mass spectrometry, um, we have been able to confirm or, or validate uh, which reagents, which uh, so some of the reagents that are recognizing very highly abundant proteins in plasma or serum, we're able to do what's called a pull down assay, capture what is bound in that sample by our reagent, and then verify the, the target identity using mass spectrometry. That approach is limited to the highest abundance proteins just because of, of the, the way that the mass spec is done for that verification. Um, some of our collaborators published in Science in 2018 a large number of proteins or of, of some of the reagents that they had performed MRM and DDA assays on to validate um, the target identity for those. And again, I would be happy to send anyone um, those references as well, so that you can see which ones have been validated by that orthogonal technique. And then the, the kind of latest orthogonal technique that a lot of people are taking to approach um, validation of, of affinity reagents is looking at correlations with uh, cis SNPs in genome-wide association studies. So there have been two large studies that have been published one, the same science paper that I just mentioned, and the other one, the nature paper that I mentioned that, that goes over um, some of the, the binding to related proteins. Those have also cataloged a large number of correlations between the soma, soma scan signal with specific cis SNPs, which indicate a change in that protein structure, and therefore we reflect a, a change in our ability to bind that protein, because again, this is all shape-based. So we would be glad to send you those references. There are some newer ones as well, um, but those are, those are some of the, the primary ways that we are approaching orthogonal validation. We, we understand that, that um, you know, people would like to see correlations with amino acids, but given the difference in the technologies, we just don't expect that to be accurate, an accurate metric for all of our reagents. Great, uh, great answer. Thanks, Sherry. Um, we have a p question uh, uh, specifically to Nir uh, regarding aging in therapeutics. What are your suggestions to know whether protein dysregulation is upstream, i.e. causative of, or downstream, i.e. resulting from aging? Right, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I try to kind of give an insight. So I'll say uh, two things and then an example of how we're going about that. So first of all, as I try to say, the challenge is that we get a lot of break, breakdowns that are the consequence of whatever happened in aging. And, and so the upstream is a little bit harder uh, to think about when you, th you think of the proteomes, except uh, what I showed on what happened between offspring of centenarians and control, their age match, and there are 29 proteins that appear in uh, offspring of centenarian, and some of them we know have a protective um, effect, or they might be modulated or, or, or other things. So we can at least use that in order to uh, guess what could be protective, at least in the people who uh, age slow. But 
one of the ways, and there are many ways we're going about it, but one of the ways we're doing now is we, our population is genotyped, actually it has exome sequencing, a lot of them have whole genome sequencing. And so we're trying to correlate between the genetics of aging and longevity to those uh, proteomics. Uh, we're collaborated with a group in uh, BU, um, Tom Pearls and Paula Sebastiani, who had a paper on a very small amount of proteomics that they've done, but they looked at one of the longevity genes that is consistent in our study and other centenarians, that's APOE2. And to look what are uh, the proteomic differences between uh, those who have APOE2 and those who uh, do not. And again, we get a cluster of protein, but it's not necessarily reflecting APOE2, but changes in inflammation or the breakdown or something like that. So it's a challenge. We have way, this way and other ways to, leave, to look forward. And, uh, and we hope to use that to get exactly what you wanted, upstream, downstream regulations. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think I have a question that I think is for Benoit. How do we know what reactome pathway is significant? Is it based off p-values? So in our study, uh, yeah, actually we, we, we did some enrichment analysis and we uh, determined which pathway were significant based on uh, adjusted p-values, so p-values that are uh, adjusted for multiple comparison. So this is how we define which pathway was the most significant. And something that uh, we, we, we did in our study is to do a sliding enrichment uh, pathway analysis, uh, because when uh, limitation of pathway analysis is actually, the pathway analysis are very dependent on what, uh, what list of genes or proteins you look at. And if you look at the top five protein or top 20 proteins or top 200 protein, you get very different results. So we developed another approach with, that we called uh, sliding enrichment pathway analysis uh, that takes this into account. Um, and uh, yeah, as I, I said before, uh, the ultimate uh, way to define which pathway or significance it's using uh, adjusted given. Great, thanks. I have another one for you, Benoit. Out of 3,000 proteins measured, are there top 10 to 12 proteins that have the highest impact on aging? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. So what we found is that uh, using only um, nine proteins, we are able to uh, predict chronological age with very high accuracy. Uh, it doesn't mean that these proteins have the most impact on aging. It means that they are sufficient to predict chronological age. And uh, as we describe in the paper, and as Nir sees in, uh, in the, the data in the very old, there is a lot of proteins that are changing during aging. It's not hundreds, it's almost, uh, it's more than a thousand that we have seen in the, uh, during, during the entire lifespan. Um, so it's possible that some of these protein changing during aging are some regulator of other. Uh, so maybe some of them are more important than other. And it's something that we are currently uh, trying to, 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 to understand, and we are looking at these kind of questions right now. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Sherry, uh, so uh, some people are asking about, uh, you know, just amazed at just being able to identify 3,000 proteins. And, um, can you talk more about just getting access to, to SOMASCAN? Right, so we are now developing um, collaborative relationships where we would like to work with partners who have interesting sample sets to make the 5,000 measurements that we currently have available um, and share those data with you. So if you are interested in that, either send us a little note in the chat window or the question and answer window, um, or you can email me directly. It's just fwilcox at somalogic.com. We also have the um, as you can see on your screen, we have a website, somalogic.com slash discovery, that has a, a place where you can click to contact us for more information. Uh, so we would be happy to uh, provide you with, with the kind of the structure of those arrangements so that we can um, get data to you as well.